Okay, in the previous video we introduced the idea of momentum and impulse and actually talked a little bit about conservation of momentum. We're going to look at what that, uh, how conservation of momentum is going to help us solve um, some problems of uh, motion. So let's think about um, a collision between two cars like the one we have here. Uh, in an isolated system where there are no external forces, the overall momentum of a system will remain the same. So we're going to define our system as this guy here, this little black line, right? Now, are there outside forces being applied to that system? Yeah, there's a normal force, there's a gravitational force from the road, it's probably a frictional force and a drag force in the leftward direction, but we're going to uh, ignore those because we're going to be looking at a fraction of a second um, and those forces won't have very long to act. So if you think about it, impulse is the change in momentum, right? So if we think about this whole system, what's the change in momentum in our fraction of a second? Well, it's force times delta t, right? So if we make that delta t really small, our impulse is going to be really small. And that means the overall momentum of our system is not going to change very much at all. Okay, so we're going to treat this as an isolated system. Now, the two cars are moving uh, at constant velocities, not the same velocity, but a constant velocity in the rightward direction. The car behind M1 bumps into this guy here. He's a jerk. He's tailgating. <laughs> Uh, and when the car bumps that car ahead, it transfers some of its momentum to this other car. You know, we can imagine that, you know, if we were, you know, the kindly driver in this nice car that's not bumping into other cars, uh, we can imagine that it would sort of jerk ourselves forward, right? We would gain some momentum from that collision. And you might say, wait a second, you just said our momentum isn't going to change. The system's momentum, the system includes both of these cars, and it's the sum of this guy's momentum and this guy's momentum. So in this collision, this car will gain a little momentum. This car will lose that same amount of momentum. Okay? So the overall momentum stays the same. Momentum of car one plus the momentum of car two initially, that's what that little i means, is equal to that same sum in the final state. That's what the little f means. We can rewrite this in a whole bunch of different ways, right? We can say, okay, just take this part of the equation and we get this. This is the change in momentum of the first car. This is the change in momentum of the second car. And we can see, oh yeah, however much the white car gains in momentum, the, the red, rust, what are we calling that? Uh, that car uh, loses that same amount of momentum. And finally, we can write this, you know, if we take this guy and add it to both sides, and we can say, oh, wait, the change in momentum of both sides uh, is equal to zero. That's conservation of momentum. This is a print, this is the a mathematical statement of the conservation of momentum of a two uh, two object system. Now, why does momentum have to be conserved? It's sort of odd, right? I mean, we're going to, you know, we can think of a tennis ball in a tennis racket, a basketball bouncing on the floor. Uh, we, we can think of all sorts of con, uh, collisions. And in all those collisions, our momentum is going to be conserved, whether we're throwing a blob of clay at something or a super ball. Um, let's check out why. Okay, so the collision lasts the same time for each car. So that's our delta t, right? And that makes good sense to us. You can't have a collision. This car can't be colliding with this car uh, when this car is not colliding with that one. Both of them are in the system. So our delta t has to be the same. Newton's third law tells us that the force that car one puts on car two has to be equal and opposite to the force that car two places on car one. 
Uh, so you see where we're going here, right? The delta T has to be the same, and the force has to be equal and opposite. So let's put that in the form of uh, uh, impulse, right? This is our impulse, F times delta T. Delta T is the same in both. This one is opposite and equal to that one. And so we can write that the impulse on both of them is the same or equal and opposite. And we know then that impulse is defined as the change in momentum. So we can write that. So there, we just derived conservation of momentum. It's fundamental. There's no way around this, right? We can't have a collision that lasts different times. There's no situation in which Newton's third law doesn't apply. Uh, and so this is always going to be true in that isolated system. So we can rearrange it to our statement of conservation of energy there and see that the conservation of momentum is a direct consequence of Newton's third law. Come straight from it, right? This is the thing that gets us there. How about that, huh? Thought we'd left Newton behind. No way. It's Newtonian physics, remember? <laughs> We're going to come back to that a lot. All right, so some key takeaways. I'll just let you look at these instead of reading them. Definition of momentum here. De de three-part definition of impulse here, right? And that three parts can help us because if we know one of these, then we can find out the other two and then recognize the importance of conservation of momentum and how fundamental it is.